be among us tonight. May our confidence be you, our rock, our safe place, our refuge in your name. Amen. You all can be seated. If you didn't get one coming in, there are notes in the back. If you want pens, Daryl has pens. He'll throw one at you. I'm very confident. <laughs> in this in this fact, Daryl will hit you with a pen. So get those notes. For those of you turning in your Bibles, we're going to be in First Samuel chapter 24. So if you want to join me there, First Samuel 24, we're going to be there very shortly. So I'm excited for tonight. You all excited to be together? So spring is upon us. First day of spring. Some of us have had spring break, some of us are on spring break, some of us will have spring break, right? Are you guys awake? You're awake? I am. So how many of you have a sibling? Alright, keep your hand up. Alright, if you have a sibling rivalry, like you're always at odds. Okay. Alright. Alright, so I'm going to open us up tonight with a little bit of my personal garbage, my sibling rivalry. So my brother and I, uh, I have one brother, his name's Matthew, he's great, and uh, I love my brother, but we are very different people. So we look like twins, but we are very different people, and one of those differences comes down to how we handle money. So how we handle Money. So, how many spenders do I have out there? If you, if you, if mom or dad gives you five, ten, twenty dollars, it's gone. It burns a hole in your pocket. All right. How many savers do I have out there? Okay. So, so the my parents, my parents taught me right. My parents taught me right. So, whenever you know, twenty dollars came in. You know, the first 10%, so the first, what? $2. There you go. Wow, we're winning at public math up here. So the first $2 went to, to the Lord, right? And then the next $2 went in savings, and then you had the rest, right? So you had 16 So the way my brother and I were different is... If I got a $20 bill, $2 went to the Lord, $2 went to saving, and the $16 went to, like, the newest Lego set possible. <laughs> or the newest toy or whatever it was. My brother was different in the fact that he enjoyed playing in the dirt, and he loved doing mechanical things, so $2 went to the Lord, and then $18 went into savings. So my brother had cash and money that he carried around all the time. I was the guy who had nothing in my pocket or my wallet, and he had like $200, you know, like just sitting there. And so the reason this is important is because one day I had a choice, and I, well, was I going to fight with my brother over something? Because my brother consistently would lose his wallet or leave it places. And that just means, as an older brother, he's not worthy of this money. So obviously he's been gifted this gift and then he leaves it. So whose is it? No one. So I'm going to claim it. So opportunity knocked one day and he left his wallet in our house uh, in the bathroom and I found it. And there was like $200 in it. And so I graciously picked up his wallet and kept it in my possession with the intention of seeing how long it was going to take my brother to figure out his money was missing. It got to bedtime, and his room, my room is in the basement, and his room is right above mine, and then our parents' room is right next to my brother's room. So there's a floor separating us, you've got to go down the steps. And so I'm lay, laying in bed, and 
I had already forgotten, you know, that I had taken his wallet like an hour and a half earlier. And he knew, so he goes looking for his wallet frantically, shows up. I'm in my covers all bundled up, nice and snug. And he shows up and he goes, where's my money? And I sarcastically looked at him and went, what money? <laughs> At this point, he knew I was the guilty culprit. He jumped on top of me, slid across my bed, where he hit the wall on the other side of my bed, and then fell on the heat register, and had a huge gash in his back. Now that in itself was bad enough. The worst part about this story is somewhere between my brother hitting the bed, hitting the wall, and hitting the heat register, my dad had managed to make it from the bedroom where he was asleep all the way down to my room. I do not yet know how that happened, how he got transposed or morphed or warped from one floor to the next. But I had my dad in my front going, what are you doing? You shook the whole house. And my brother's like, he took my wallet. And I'm like, I'm innocent. And I had a choice, and it turned out badly. It was just bad. But then I got punished, and I got whooped, because I came from the generation where when you messed up, you got whooped. <laughs> and you know what? I turned out okay. <laughs> All right? But I had a choice. Was I going to seize this opportunity? And tonight, we're going to look at an opportunity David had. Was David... The guy we've been talking about in this series, On the Rise, in 1 Samuel, was David going to seize an opportunity? Was he going to listen to that voice inside of him that was going to say, you nearly need to do this like you deserve this? Or was he going to listen to God's voice? So if you guys could stand up with me real quick. We're going to read 1 Samuel 24, and I'm going to start in verse 2. Yeah, stand up. There we go. Cheer for the reading of God's word. We've not done that. So, all right, stand for the reading of God's word. All right, there we go. All right. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. There we go. The wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. This is Saul went in to take a dump. That's what happened. Now David, it's, it's in the Bible. You guys should read the Bible. It's in there. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at this passage and we talk about David, your servant, may we see tonight that you want to work in our lives. May we see a model for how we're supposed to serve, listen, and follow you. I pray that you would use my words over the next few minutes to speak about what you have placed in your word. Because mine don't matter. Yours infinitely, eternally matter. I pray that you would open hearts to receive what you have for us tonight. In your name, amen. Alright, you all can be seated. So, alright, I need the first thing on top of your notes, so... If you want this sermon in one kind of ish sentence, go ahead and put it up there. God's servants trust God's voice and God's timing. God's servants trust God's voice and God's timing. And what we're going to see is that David in this example is going to follow the Lord's voice and the Lord's timing. And we should as well. We're going to fail at this. But this is the desire, is that when we serve the Lord, we're going to trust God's voice and God's timing. But before we jump into that, we have another phrase that we need to talk about. So I need you all to complete this for me. Yeah, there it is. It's the context one. Go for it. So context is? 
Okay, you have got more than this. Context is... Everything. Okay, this is going to be something that continues to come up. So, context is... Everything. Alright. Anytime you read something from God's Word, there's something that happened before it, and usually there's something that happened after it. Unless you're reading like Genesis 1-1, which actually when you read Genesis 1-1, and then you get to later in the Bible, you figure out John 1 and Hebrews 1 go before Genesis 1. But the point here is this. Whenever you're reading something in Scripture, we need to remember there's a context. There's something going on. And so as we enter this story of David, we need to remember where we were before. And so last week you had me up here talking about David and Goliath. And since David and Goliath, some things have happened. Because as you all just saw in the passage, Saul wants to kill David. Which is not where we left David and Goliath. And so David kills Goliath. This big victory happens for Israel. So what happened? It's only been a few chapters. So David comes back to the kingdom of Israel and all the people are excited, and they actually sing, make a song. And they say, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And let's just say, Saul was not happy about that. And so King Saul is the one who is ruling the kingdom. But our series is called On the Rise because God had chosen David, and the Lord was with David, who was going to take over. And so we reached some other passages in context-wise. 18, 28 through 29 is up on the screen for you guys. But it says this, it says, But when Saul saw or witnessed and knew that the Lord was with David, Samuel leaves no question that the Lord was with David. And that Michal, or Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. And so the chapters, this sets off, this jealousy in Saul sets off about four to five chapters of hide and seek. Of David would be given this impossible task, go out and fight these armies. He would go and he would do it. The people would love him. They would get excited. Then Saul would try to kill him. And then David would escape. And then David would come back. And then Saul would try to kill him. And then David would escape. And then we come up on... 23, 14, it says, And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness and in the country of the wilderness of Ziph. That's cool, Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. Every day, Saul was like, I gotta kill this dude because the Lord is with him. He's gonna take over my kingdom. But God did not give him into his hand. The Lord was with David. And that's important. We want the Lord with us. We want His presence no matter what. The first blank you have there is God's servants check every voice with God's voice. God's servants check every voice with God's voice. And how does David model that for us in this story? I'm going to start in 24 verse 1. It says, When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And so David was in the wilderness. Saul comes back from fighting these Philistines again. And then he gets word, Yo, David, we know where he's at. You want to go kill him again? Or try to kill him? And Saul's like, here we go. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men, which is the passage we read earlier, some chosen warriors to go after David. And he came to the sheepfold by way of the cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. We already talked about this. And as you enter a cave, you remember, you all have gone caving, I'm sure. Nope. But when you enter a space that's light, all right, I'll just, when you go from a space that's lit or light, yeah, it's lit in here. Okay, light. <laughs> Humor is not going to work on you guys tonight. I'm just convinced of this. Okay, so when you enter a room that's dark from somewhere where that's light, your eyes have to adjust. 
And so the scripture tells us that David and his men were in the innermost parts of the cave. And so as Saul enters this cave, he can't see David or his men. It says, And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Seems opportunity knocks, right? Just like me and my brother's wallet, David has this opportunity. Am I going to take justice into my own hands and kill the king? And then his men say, this is the opportunity you've been looking for. Look, they even say, behold, the Lord said it. I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. But remember, I told you all earlier, context is everything. As we read, most commentators believe, and I believe this as well as I was reading, this was never said by the Lord. So this promise by David's men is like, hey, the Lord never explicitly tells David that he's going to be the one who kills Saul. And so here's not only exterior voices that are telling David to do something that seems right, he's got to check, is that actually God's voice? And this happens in our lives all the time, is that we have exterior voices that tell us about life, about ourselves, about who God is. And just like Adam and Eve in the garden, as I was thinking about this and Genesis 3 came to mind, those exterior voices are going to question what God says. Those exterior voices are going to question what God says. And where Satan says, did God really say this? But also, we're going to fight interior voices. We're going to fight not only exterior voices that try to tell us things, but exterior, but interior ones. Put the quote up on the screen, Samantha. There's this quote that I really love. It says, no one has lied to you, put you down, or said more meaner things to you than you. You hear 100% of the words that you never speak. And so I'm convinced that when we get in God's word and we hear that we're loved, that we're chosen, that he cares about us, those words are powerful, but they're only powerful if you listen to God's voice. We don't spend time in God's word or presence enough for some of those voices to even make it into our soul. And so what I do is I go through my day thinking that I'm a failure, that I'm always going to be broken, that I'm not going to be perfect, and I'm always going to fall short. And instead of reminding myself of God's promises. And so we need to be people and God's servants desire to be people who spend time listening to God's voice and know what God's voice is. If you know God's voice, then you will be able to see the lies of the enemy. But if we don't know God's voice, we don't stand a chance. The final thing I would say upon this is I have this short post-it note in my office and it's my reminder. Yeah, that's my sign language for post-it note. <laughs> uh, I saw Samantha over there, was, or Sydney over there was having fun with it. So anyway, back on track. I have something for me. Even as I spend daily time in God's word, I want to wonder at and wonder in God's word daily. So I talk about wonder at. I want to see it fresh and new. We look at God's word and we get used to what's there and we tune it out. We turn to a story and we go, I already know what's there. I don't need this. I know what it's about. And so I'm always asking God, I want to wonder, spelled W-O-N-D-E-R. I want to look at it fresh and new and say, okay, let's throw out everything I know and let's see it fresh and new. But I also want to wonder, W-A-N-D-E-R, in it daily. I want to just go around and say, what's God doing over here? And what's God doing over here? And look at this over here. And I find new places and new things. And it's a journey in God's word. 
We see the Bible as black and white. But the more we wonder at it and wonder in it, we see it's a beautiful picture. And it just comes to color and to life. So, that's my short thing on God's servants check every voice with God's voice. But you can't check the voices inside your life or outside your life with God's voice if you don't know this. People end up in my office, in Daryl's office, or his house, or his community group, and people end up in Patrick's office, and they say, I just want God's will for my life. I want to know what he wants me to do. And they sit across from us, and he goes, something to the tune of, well, have you been in church? Uh, have you been in community? Uh, have you been reading God's word? Uh, like, he's given us this, that we can spend time and hear his words directly. And so we need to know God's voice. Moving on through the passage, let's see what David does. Instead of responding to this counsel, it says, and afterwards, oh, wait, I skipped a little bit. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So David sneaks up to King Saul and cuts off a corner of his robe. <coughs> and afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. This was a, a symbol of laying a hand against a person. And so David's like, I can't take the guy's life. So he takes a corner of his robe to show how close he was, and he still feels bad about it. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. Here's what he said. He said, I know that God has placed King Saul in leadership, and it's not my job to remove him. The Lord will do that. And so as I was reading through this, I was thinking about pastors and spiritual leaders in my life and people who have authority. That it's really easy for us to go down this rabbit trail of, I could do it better. I could make better decisions. But God has placed people in authority in our lives for a reason, and he's the one who appoints and removes leadership. And so here David is honoring whom God had in leadership. It says, so for David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So Saul's done, moves on. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? These have been rumors swirling around that David wants to kill the king, but they weren't true. It says, Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. He's clearly making it distinguished to Saul. I still follow you as king. I still respect your authority and leadership. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. In the verse 12 it says, May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. This leads us to point Two, God's servants trust God's justice. God's servants trust God's justice. We live in a revenge society where if nobody is going to do anything, i got to get mine and they got to pay. And those who follow the Lord trust God's justice. This is modeled by David. Here's a man who tried to kill him multiple times. And he's saying the Lord is the just judge. It's not for me to exact justice, but the Lord is going to do it. It goes on to say, as the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea, may the Lord 
Therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Finally, Saul sees the error of his ways and he said, Man, this guy is not out to kill me. He's not out to overthrow me. And he says, I've done wrong. And so as much as it's on our hearts, to be real with you guys, when people do wrong to us, we as human beings long for justice. I think it is hardwired into every single one of us that we want to see all these wrongs be made right. And there's this beautiful thing because the Bible talks about it. There's a day coming when King Jesus will be on the throne and he will set everything right. The problem in this situation is that you and I want immediate justice for the wrongs other people do to us. But what about the wrongs we do to other people? See, I'm really quick when somebody burns me or isn't friends with me or denies me or lies about me to want justice and want them to be punished. But what about the times that I lied or I failed someone or I didn't deliver on a promise or I sinned against the Lord? And so what we want for us is justice for anything somebody does to us. But then as soon as we do something to someone, what do we want? We want mercy and grace. We want mercy. It's like, oh, I'm a failed human being. And so the follower of Jesus, the servant of God, trusts the just judge. We trust the Lord with that. We know that we've messed up and we've wronged people. And so we have a better and a bigger perspective of what's going on. And so David models that for us and Saul witnesses it. Let's keep reading through. There's something really cool that happens. He said, Saul says to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt with me, and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? It's like this demonstrates that you're not against me. So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me therefore by the Lord that you will not cut off my offspring after me and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Pulling back to verse 20, I went by it real quick, but here's the point that we learned from it, is that God's servants trust God's timing. This is probably the hardest part, I would say, or the three points for tonight, for me personally, God's timing, because we live in an instant gratification culture. And so Saul says, I now know that you are going to be king. And that this is going to happen. Which David had already been told about. But he's still waiting on God's timing for things. So personally for me, sometimes it's really easy to, okay, I know God, I know your voice. Alright God, I know you're just and justice is coming. But can we talk about the timing bit? Because your timetable is not working out for me. <laughs> We can feel like that. But here we see David model that God's servants trust God's timing. And so we're going to continue through this series on the rise. And we're going to see that David's going to continue to go forward. And he's going to exhibit these things that we've talked about. He's going to listen to God's voice. He's going to trust God's justice. And he's going 
to trust God's timing. But there's going to be moments he failed. He didn't do it perfectly. And we know the perfect one who did it was Jesus. And that comes up later. But as I was thinking about how to end tonight, I put up a question. And that question is, so what? What does this mean for us? And the question I think we want to walk away with is, are we God's servants? Is that kind of where you're at? Are you working through those things? Here's kind of what I'm talking about there is, we see David do an example for us. We're supposed to be modeling some of the same things if we're following God. It's hard. It's a daily struggle to do these things. It's a daily struggle to, to listen to only God's voice, to trust His justice, and to trust His timing. Because this is what we're used to. We're discipled by culture. And this, to put it in as clear language as I can put it, is are we going to be discipled by culture, or are we going to be discipled by Christ? Because here's what our culture tells us, and you breathe this air so much that I'm convinced, and I do as well, that we don't even notice when we're being discipled by culture versus Christ. Because when it comes to voices, what does the world tell us? Culture tells us your voice matters more than any other voice. Your voice matters more than any other voice. That it's you. That you define what's right for you. That you define what's right in your heart. And there's a God who loves you. Who says, no, my voice, my words spoken out for you. That you were loved and created matter more than the voices inside your head. Your identity comes from me, not from you. What about justice? Our culture tells us justice. You've got to do what's right. You've got to get what's yours. Whereas God tells us, justice belongs to me because I know everything. Forgive because you've been forgiven much. But what about timing? Culture tells us, I see it. I like it. I want it. I got it. There it is. I hear you did do the part. But that's how culture tells us. Timing. Do not wait. I see it. I want it. I like it. I got it. No, Joe. No. That is not. That's what culture tells us. You go after it now. You shortcut it now. You go after what's yours now. Where the Lord tells us what? The Lord tells us trust my timing. Because I know the big picture. I can see the whole thing. And so today, as I was thinking about the Lord's timing, and you're thinking about my terrible rap skills, I was going to read from Proverbs. Because I'm reading from Proverbs in Old Testament right now, my Old Testament class, and it talks about tapping in and listening to God's voice, trusting His justice, and trusting His timing. So listen to these words. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. It's going to tell us that if we're disciples of Christ and we're following God, we're going to follow Him with all of our heart. And do not lean on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge the Lord, and He will make your path straight. It says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And saying this, if we follow his voice, his justice, and his timing, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Proverbs talk us about when we follow the Lord, he restores our soul. When you follow the culture, it ends in tragedy. But when we follow Jesus, we can see the end, that it ends in triumph. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this message that you've been working in my life, but also across our student ministry. And just as I think about David, we fail so many times. We don't listen to your voice. We don't trust your justice or your timing. 
I pray tonight, Lord, that just one of those areas you'd show us that we need to work on. And I pray that you would provide the strength for us to do it. May we serve you and only you. In your name, amen.